All right, well, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kendra and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the New York Transit Museum. This program is part of Transit After Hours, which is a series of conversations, presentations, workshops, and performances inspired by Transit Museum's collections and exhibitions. So before I introduce our presenters and start this evening's program, I wanna tell you a bit about the Transit Museum in case you haven't visited us before. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. All right, can you all see that? Okay, so we opened in 1976 as part of the Bicentennial as a New York City Transit Exhibition. And we became a New York Transit Museum in the 1980s. We're located in a decommissioned IND subway station in downtown Brooklyn. And we also have a gallery and shop in Grand Central Terminal. We have programs for all ages. And in the non-pandemic year, we serve over half a million visitors a year. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. And I'd also like to add that if you, if you wanna use closed caption this evening and you're on a computer, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen and click on show subtitle. And if you're on a phone or tablet, you can turn on captioning by clicking more and then meeting settings. Um, additionally, we invite you to use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen to ask questions about the program. And now I'll introduce our presenters. So our first presenter is our associate curator, Jody Shapiro. Jody is a lifelong New Yorker and she has been working at the Transit Museum since May of 2014. Prior to becoming associate curator, she worked at the museum's archive with all the cool photos. She's curated shows about the Second Avenue subway, the IRT Flushing Line, the Redbird fleet of subway cars, and the Polis Brothers. She holds a master's in library science, has way too many cameras, and fears her enormous LP collection will be the death of her someday. <laughs> And last but not least, Angelina Lippert is the chief curator of Poster House in New York City, the first museum in the U.S. dedicated to the impact and history of the poster. She holds an MA in the arts of Russian avant-garde from Courtauld in London, and a BA in theology and art history from Smith College. She is the author of the Art Deco Poster and has lectured as, at SVA, the Cooper Union, Columbia University, and Sotheby's. She is a contributing writer to the Muse by the Clio Awards, where she focuses on history of advertising design and is an editor for Vintage Poster Magazine. And now here's Angelina. Hi, everyone. Um, as they mentioned, I'm Angelina Lippert, the chief curator of Poster House in New York, um, which is the first and only museum dedicated to posters in the United States. So I'm gonna be giving you tonight a brief history of the public service announcement and how they've evolved over the past 150 years, primarily in the United States. I'll be giving some examples from other countries, but the US tended to have a more dynamic history of PSAs. So that's what I'll be focusing on for most of my talk. And while I'm talking, if you have questions in the chat or in the Q&A section, Jody is going to rudely interrupt me, talk over me and get me to answer your questions. So I will be answering as you throw them at me. Um, but I will not personally be able to see the chat while that's happening. So now I'm going to share my screen and get on with the show. Jody, can you see my first slide? Yes, I can. Amazing. All right. Obviously, so you, see, you see our lovely poster house logo designed by Paula Schur. So now, before we delve into the specific branch of poster history, that is PSAs, I wanna give you an idea of how posters were born in the 1800s so that we're all on the same page regarding what a poster is and what a poster isn't. So before the 1860s, advertising around the world was limited to broadsides, which are text-based announcements primarily printed in black or brown, like these. Occasionally there would be a tip-on, which is a separately printed piece of paper with an image on it, normally a woodblock image. So if you were selling shoes, you might have a very simple image of a shoe pasted into an open area on the paper. Or in this case, a woodblock recruitment poster where the image is actually a hand-carved design treated as raised type. Now, the problem with broadsides is that they require that their audience be literate, which is really not something you can presume of all classes at the end of the 1800s in Europe. 
They're also pretty drab in color and they lacked any kind of dynamism. So unless you were right up on them and a particular word caught your eye, they were pretty easy to ignore. Uh, this image is meant to show you how overbearing and word heavy most of these images were. You can see a few hints of what's to come. This image is actually a, a little later than the broadsides I showed you, but you get a sense of how boring text ads are en masse. Now then, in the 1860s, Jules Charest, known today as the father of the poster, perfected the already developed method of stone lithography so that suddenly large scale color lithographs could be made cheaply and quickly. And thus, color advertising was born. Now, a lot of historians refer to this time period, so the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, as the color explosion, because that's exactly what it was. So now, whenever you walked down the street, you weren't confronted with rows and rows of drab text, but layer upon layer of colorful, brightly designed images jumping off the walls, sometimes three stories high. These pictures were so hard to ignore that some critics said things like these posters were assaulting their eyes, forcing them to look at busty women selling cigarettes and cabarets. But others saw this moment as a triumph for public art. Because if you were not wealthy, the only other place you would have seen color like this would have been in a church's stained glass. Museums were not yet a common activity for the middle and lower classes, and newspapers weren't printed in color. So imagine an entire demographic of society being exposed to big, beautiful design en masse for the first time. It's a, a revolutionary moment. So while advertising certainly existed prior to this period, it was either something you saw in a magazine or a newspaper or that you came in contact with as a broadside or, or a printed notice on the street. All of this changed though with the advent of color posters. So now the image rather than the text is the dominant force. You, like you don't need to read this poster. The, the, you don't need to read that this poster says toys and the name of the department store. You can just tell by the presence of a happy child on a rocking horse holding a bunch of toys that this is probably an ad for toys. And that's a, a huge moment for advertising because you now have access to everyone regardless of literacy, income level, interest, there's like no barrier for entry with a poster. And the images are on the street, so they can't be ignored very easily. So if you go outside into the world, you will come in contact with these ads, whether you like it or not. Now, interestingly, it took the government and other organizations interested in informing the public a while to tap into the fun functional use of posters. We don't really see PSAs as we think of them today, until around World War I. That's almost 50 years since large-scale poster advertising first appears. There are obvious exceptions to this rule, but by and large, there isn't a mass push to inform the public of necessary or helpful information until the mid to late 19 teens. At this time, you start seeing a combination of posters aimed at informing people about public health issues like the Spanish flu, as well as posters instructing people to take advantage of public initiatives like the birth registry, prenatal care options, and the push for a living wage as a means of ensuring a good environment for raising children. This is also the time that you start seeing posters telling citizens how they can help the war effort through conservation of food. And you'll notice that the motivating force in these images is a sense of civic duty or, or patriotism. That by following these guidelines, you are proving yourself to be a quote, good American. So you have this sort of bridge between the government and these instructions on the public good. And that's really the dawn of how public service announcements functioned in most Western countries within posters. Then in the 1930s, FDR's WPA created thousands of posters around New Deal initiatives, many of which are highlighted um, or highlighted issues of public health and work safety. And these were mostly created at a very local level and were predominantly silk screened rather than printed through lithography. So that means smaller runs, faster designs. You'll see in the margins of many of these posters that they, they indicate that they were done by certain groups. So for example, many of these were done by the city of Chicago. You can see in the upper margin of the poster on the left, um, others appear more state or nationally focused, like the safety goggles one on the right aimed presumably at all of Illinois. 
or this one, which is essentially promoting health, the health benefits for a baby via its mother's breast milk. But there is no region or city mentioned anywhere on here. One can imagine this would have been printed and promoted nationally. This one is rather risque for the time, don't you think? Um, a little bit, but remember, the 30s had a lot of like naked ladies in murals, so this isn't really that risque. And also, our, all of our World War I advertising were like half-naked women embodying Columbia or the Statue of Liberty, like rushing into battle. So the the, the idea of the the mother child, like it's also a very like Christian image, um, was 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 a standard motif in posters. I never thought about it that way. I just I see a poster like this and I think of people getting uncomfortable that women are breastfeeding <laughs> their kids. You know? Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's interesting that like we have such a. There, I know there's always a debate about nursing in public now, where something like this would have been like, Meh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions in the chat yet, Jody? Not yet. Okay. You're thrilling them with all these facts. Oh, really? Hold. On, let me get some water. Mm. Okay, so by the time we entered World War II, poster PSA messaging shifted toward how you, as a non-enlisted citizen, can help the country and your community. So posters about carpooling to save resources become commonplace. And, and here they're, they're saying you're helping Hitler win if you don't ride share. We also see posters like this instructing women to save cans for ammunition or kitchen grease for explosives. You'll also notice that the line between a public service announcement and propaganda is a little blurred at this period in time. And that's something you'd find anywhere where notices from the government will almost always reflect the political as well as the social priorities of whomever's in power. So here, patriotism during the war effort is the good feeling you're supposed to have while following through on this public message or instruction. Now, going from civilian life into the world of the military, PSAs also found their way into army barracks where we see a ton of images instructing soldiers on matters of sexual health. It's often asked why there are so many STD posters from World War II, almost all of which would have been aimed internally to people in the army rather than like random civilians on the street or in a bar. And the answer is pretty interesting. So during World War I, at, every, at any given time, 15% uh, of US troops were unable to fight because they were being treated for STDs, most of which they got while sleeping with like good time girls abroad. In fact, there's a quote somewhere where Woodrow Wilson says that if we had come up with a way to cure VD, we could have gotten out of the war a year earlier. So during World War II, we wanted to make sure that we were not losing troops to preventable diseases. So posters like this were widespread within all branches of the military. But like I mentioned earlier, these posters promote positive public health, of course, but the reason is because the military wants to have as many soldiers fighting for it at any given time. So again, that tension between like the public good versus what's good for the government at that time. Now, because STDs were still a thing, even with all that messaging, posters like this showed up after the war in doctor's offices, telling returning soldiers to get checked before sleeping with their new bride because we want healthy citizens and our birth rates like about to go through the roof. Now, similar signage starts appearing in the subways like this poster from the Transit Museum's collection. At the top, you'll notice that 1948 has been written in pencil. Jody, I'm, I'm presuming this was done by an archivist at some point, correct? Um, actually, no, um, this oh. is handwritten notes by uh, Amelia Opdyke Jones herself. Uh, oh, wow. This is a gouache painting from our archives. We have a bunch of her original artwork that was made into something oh, cool. called the Subway Sun. Um, I don't, uh, uh, Amelia Opdyke Jones was also known as Oppie. Uh, mm -hmm. She lived from 1913 to 1993 and uh, she crafted the Subway Sun campaign from the mid 1940s until the mid 1960s. Uh, we have some more of her stuff in the slideshow, I think. So oh, I yeah, can tell you, of, I can tell you a little bit more about her as we see more Subway Sun things. Well, one thing that I was actually gonna bring up because I, I, at first I was like, I love how this doctor's dressed like George Washington. But then as I looked at other people in the other figures in the in the Oppie posters, this figure shows up again and again. Yeah, he, uh, that, like that's- Paul Revere or who is he? Uh, that is Father Nick, Father Knickerbock Knickerbocker. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, he appears as Dr. Knicker Knickerbocker in this ad. Um, he is in several posters uh, promoting Penzi and he's shaking hands with like the Penzi guy. So uh, he is he's an archetype of a good New York citizen. 
That's so cool. You'll, yeah, guys, you're going to see him in a bunch of posters soon. Um, also, specifically relating to subway bound PSAs, um, this is one of the earlier posters that fits within my kind of like pet theory and uh, observance of health posters, particularly for STDs tend to appear in the subways first before they appear above ground, if at all. Um, so I hope this leads to somebody's like PhD dissertation one day, but I just <laughs> think that's a really interesting tension that that, that uh, health posters tend to be in the subways first. Well, I mean, I my my armchair hypothesis about that mm -hmm. is just because uh, when, when these posters appeared in the subway in the mid forties, um, ridership was, getting to be at an all-time high. So I guess they figured that they had the eyes to see these important messages. Yeah. I also, from a total poster nerd type historian kind of view on the right-hand side, where right above the word social hygiene at the very bottom, the O in worth is capitalized, but the rest isn't. Yeah. I find, I, 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 I'm just like, oh, that's interesting. The old phone exchange. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Well, is that where I'm going to? Yes, 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 ha ha. Um, so while all this is happening, there was also a very effective campaign in Europe and America during World War II about being careful of what you say. So if you wrote your wife that you were heading into battle on a specific date or in a specific location, that could be intercepted and result in your entire platoon being killed. Where, or, or if you said something in your local bar about what your friend in the army told you, someone spying for the enemy could hear it. Like even the girl you pick up for a one night stand could be working for the other side. So this concept of leaking information was a real threat since the element of surprise would win the war essentially. So posters like this indicating those dramatic consequences became incredibly commonplace. So here on the, on the left, you see a sailor drowning because his ship was torpedoed and uh, a deadly headline on the right pointing to the person who may have caused that headline and a really cute dog resting in front of a gold star, which was the symbol of, of a family who had lost a son in the war. So these are, these are all PSAs because they're instructing the public on what not to do if they wanna keep their loved ones safe abroad. Now PSAs continued to be prevalent in most countries through the 40s, 50s, 60s, especially as science started really emphasizing the need for mass public health action. So this is how we stopped tuberculosis, polio, major diseases that we don't really even think of today. And part of eradicating them was educating the public. And that's really what PSAs are at their best. It is a means of educating the public en masse. It goes back to the idea of not having to make people seek information out, but just being presented with it in a way that they can't ignore. So the new transit authority also amped up their public health notifications, um, telling us not to spit or cough or sneeze without covering our mouths. Um, Judy, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about the Subway Sun now, how long it functioned in the subways, how it started as an initiative. I personally sure. love like the rich purple of this poster and then it yeah. tells us to like cover our face, but also to seek medical attention. Yeah, well, um, the Subway Sun was launched in 1918 um, it was, it, and it was, a, there was a sister publication to it called, um, called the, uh, Elevated Express, uh, mm -hmm. because at that time, not all of the, not all the lines that we know as the subway of today were all underground. Some of them were elevated. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. some are still elevated, but they were run by elevated companies yeah. like the BMT. This was before unification in 1940. Uh, so the posters enabled, uh, the IRT and the BMT, to address their customers directly in kind of an un informal way and uh, often amusing. Uh, and there were, you know, each poster was pretty much structured just like this one here where there was the main graphic statement in the field. And there were two little boxes in either corner with like another interesting fact or useful information. Um, and these, these posters, the Subway Sun and the Elevated Express, uh, were aiming to personalize the company to give it kind of a human face. Um, the gentleman who who uh, started the Subway Sun and the Elevated Express was a guy named Ivy Lee. Uh, he was an advertising guru. Mm -hmm. He uh, hired Fred G. Cooper, who is a, a famous illustrator in his own right. He worked for Life Magazine for a long time. Um, a lot of the early Subway Suns pre-1945, 46 are his. Um, 
The sun, subway sun went on until 1932 when the IRT had declared bankruptcy and entered receivership. Uh, but it was revived again in the 1940s. And that was when Fred Cooper said, you know what, I don't have time to do this anymore. But why don't you ask my friend Amelia Opdyke Jones? And she's really good and she'll be great at doing this because she's got a knack. And mm -hmm. so Amelia took over the Subway Sun and the posters rocketed in popularity. Um, so and you can kind of see why. Uh, oh, yeah, they're great. Did she, did she, so she drew them, did she do all the type, the lettering and the graphics as well? She did. Um, when I said before that she crafted the Subway Sun campaign, I mean just that. Um, even though she worked for the for, first the Board of Transportation and then the New York City Transit Authority because the agency changes its name over her tenure. Um, she came up with the ideas for the poster. She sketched them out. She she uh, figured out the language and she did all of the execution. Uh, she had a little bit of guidance from her bosses, but not that much. Uh, and that kind of got her a lot of attention um, with some of her more controversial posters that showed like women hitting men with their purses because they're standing in uh, the doorway of the of the subway. Um, well, you gotta do not, what you gotta do. <laughs> yeah, well, people did not realize that Oppie, which is her pen name, and you can kind of see it in the lower left hand corner. Yeah. It's Oppie. Um, yeah. People did not realize that Oppie was a woman. So some of the complaint letters that the authority would get would be, you know, this gentleman shouldn't encourage women to hit men with their purses. <laughs> and so uh, eventually uh, Oppie was outed as a female, um, which is pretty badass. I mean, yeah, you know, her sense of humor is is really it's a very light touch. Um, and you'll see later on when you I know you have some more posters from yeah. her. Um, her economy of line when drawing these figures oh, is great. really expressive. Uh, so, you know, that well, kind it of- It seems to come out like the comic book style almost. Yeah, I mean, you know, she did, she did do single panel comics before she worked for the Transit Authority. She had a comic called The Young Idea. Idea? And idea oh. with an R. And it was, uh, it was syndicated by King Features. It was one of the earliest syndicated comics in the United States. Oh, wow. So she has this rich background in graphic representation of story ideas. Huh. And actually, if I go back, wait, nope. If I go back, the so the one that we were just looking at under Subway Sun, you'll see like New York City Transit Authority, and then it'll say like number eleven and, and which volume it is. Did these all have seasons? Like this they, is number one, volume twenty-one. The, it's it's hard for us to determine exactly how many of these were were made. Um, mm -hmm. the volume numbers and the volume numbers seem to switch. So we can date them to, in the best cases, the actual year that they appeared in. Mm -hmm. I believe this one is from 1948 um, mm -hmm. by the volume number because there's some documentation in internal communications uh, that say, oh, you know, Subway Sun volume 22 starts today you know, starts this month. Uh, they sometimes did two or three Subway Suns in a month, sometimes one, sometimes four. So that kind of throws it off a oh, little wow. bit. Okay, um, so they were regularly published. They were regularly published. Uh, there was at least one every month. Um, okay. So it's, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of difficult even for us to figure it out. Um, we do have something of a key, uh, uh, inventory now that we're starting to pour over and match with what we have in our collection. Cool. Sorry, that was a very long explanation. No, of, no, but I love it. A simple we'll question that a, you had. We'll be giving a talk on Oppie with Jody at Poster House sometime. Uh, Salvador will put the link in the chat at some point. But if you want to know more about Oppie, sign up for that. She's a kick-ass um, lady. Indeed. And we love kick-ass ladies at Poster House. Um, so back to this poster. Um, the one thing I really like about it is that if that the the purpose of it is that not just about keeping the subway environment nice for everybody, but it's also telling you to make your own health your own priority. So you have the the box in the upper left saying like make it nice for everyone, and then the upper right like make it nice for you. And now looking at the previous posters and this one, 
it feels almost like nothing's changed. Covering your face when you sneeze and washing your hands continues to be like a number one push within PSAs then and now, which is pretty interesting because you'd think we would have gotten it by now. Um, it's also interesting to think of where PSAs are placed and who their audience is at any given time. So the one I showed you of the bride and groom about STDs, that would have been in a doctor's office where you could have easily asked for a test. Uh, those ones about saving cans or kitchen grease were aimed at women and probably displayed in areas where housewives congregated. So church bulletin boards, grocery stores, PSA locations tend to be targeted and not especially like PC or creative. Actually, uh, we have a question in the chat that uh, dovetails very nicely with what you just said. Okay, I'll, um, I'll go back. Somebody wants to know if there were any complaints from the powers that be that uh, these public service announcement posters took up space from paid advertising. No, because th th at that time, I mean, up until, f actually, I, I don't know about advertising today with public health. Actually, no because we, uh, my talk ends with the posters we did for around the pandemic. Advertisers, when there's a good cause, will often donate space for public health initiatives um, or, the, or uh, the government will purchase that space. So it's not, it, it's not really necessarily taking away from advertising dollars. Um, also, like if this is put up in a church, like that's not really taking, no, Coca-Cola is not advertising in the church. Um, like it's, <laughs> not, it's yet. not necessarily in those spaces that you would, they're not in like official advertising, like hordes necessarily. They can be, but they aren't always there. Interesting. Indeed. Um, so moving on. So looking just at the New York subway, we get some like great examples of PSAs, PSAs aimed at city dwellers. So most of which are created by a woman who, as Jody pointed out, went by the name of Oppie and who created the Subway Sun series, which was essentially a collection of these like amazing comic-like images that appeared above the seats in subway cars and informed riders in an appealing way about various public services, opportunities, or requests. So as Jody said, these thrived in the 50s and 60s, so much so that tra the Transit Museum recently did a show of them. Right. Didn't you, there, wasn't there a, a, a show you did recently on, on these posters? There was a show uh, about transit etiquette where yes. uh, these Oppie posters were prominently featured in our Grand Central Gallery. And uh, it's also a smaller version of it is in our uh, Brooklyn location, which is still not open to the public, but soon, I hope. hope. Uh, and there's Father Knickerbocker again. Yeah, I actually like New Yorkers to wake up. Well, I, th this poster is actually a riff on a famous World War One slogan, uh, a poster called Wake Up America, which was about being prepared for the war. Um, here, it's about being prepare prepared for various city emergencies and joining one of many civil defense groups, like becoming a volunteer firefighter like my dad. Um, the Subway Sun also aimed to inform subway goers about nutrition, how, how wholesome. <laughs> it's interesting that earlier examples of the Sun haven't um, have it sponsored by the New York Transit Authority, but now it's the Board of Transportation in conjunction with the Department of Health. The, do, yeah, do the, board of the Board of Transportation was in existence before the New York City Transit Authority. Um, mm -hmm. After unification, there were a couple of years where it was sort of unclear, you know, like who was going to run what, and the Board of Transportation ended up being the New York City Transit Authority, which today is part of the MTA, but they, the Transit Authority is responsible for running the buses and the subways. Got it, so both, so you'll see both of them listed as essentially- Yeah, the earlier posters, posters will be Board of Transportation and the later ones will have New York mm -hmm. City Transit Authority. Love it. Um, the 1960s saw uh, a new addition to subway PSAs with the introduction of Etty the Cat, yes, Everyone Etiquette. loves Etiquette. Etiquette. We get <laughs> we get more questions about Etiquette uh, than pretty much anything else, oh. uh, except like why there is no X train or no Y train, like those sorts of questions. Uh, Etiquette is awesome. I love uh, Etiquette. He was only around uh, for a short while. He was introduced in 1962, and, yes, and another kick-ass lady. Uh, named oh, really? Joe Mary McCormick Sakurai. She created it. Uh, this is her cat. Uh, his name was Pipsqueak. And the initial run of the Etiquette posters were in 3,000 subway cars. So that was about half the fleet at the time. Oh, wow. Uh, the, and 
the transit museum has a collection of only a couple of them um but etiquette was also the star of his own book about etiquette is it sold uh, in your fabulous gift shop it's not um we're trying to get one for our collection because it's way way out of print but um mm -hmm. everybody loved pipsqueak uh apparently there was a press conference where the press could ask questions of pipsqueak i, uh, I would want to know yeah, I, I would love to know what Pipsqueak, you know, is thinking. He was like, he was like the Groundhog Day Groundhog? Like, uh, maybe. Film? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they brought him out, like, you know, and showed him around. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm visual. I'm like making a gesture and nobody could see me. Um, somebody, <laughs> in the chat, like this? <laughs> somebody in the chat commented about the please, sorry, thanks uh, token yes. icon. Uh, that was all, that was uh, a holdover from Amelia Opdykes Jones um, that appeared in a bunch of her uh, 60s posters. Well, um, didn't she also do the text in this poster? I, you know, I can't say for sure, but I've looking at, at so many of her posters that we have in our collection, mm -hmm. it really looks like her lettering. So I feel, I feel comfortable saying that there's a strong possibility that she did it. She still was working for the transit mm -hmm. authority at this point. So, you know, perhaps it was Joe Mary that uh, came up with the concept and the text um, and Oppy, you know, did the execution of the the artistic part. Um, yeah, we don't know who took the photo of Pipsqueak, but we're trying to figure it out. Well, I mean, I love also love that this is a, a sort of like a cutout and photo montage onto this like larger poster. Yeah. So not sure that this with with this like rather lengthy copy would have effectively stopped anyone from like adding graffiti to a subway car. But I approve of the wordy though important sentiment. Um, now, these are two of my favorite etiquette posters. Um, <laughs> the one on the left, obviously supporting the idea that giving up one seat to a little white haired lady is a worthy endeavor, worthy of a medal even. Um, and the one on the right, reminding you to step lively when getting on and off the train. Again, both sentiments that we still need to remind people of today. Well, you know, the, the funny thing about looking at all of these posters through the years and looking through all the Subway Sons that we have in our collection, you know, and you had uh, some anti-spitting posters yes. in the beginning of the presentation. Spitting is the one behavior that has never been effectively curbed. Like people still spit yeah. in the subway in public. It's totally disgusting. I don't know why people do it, but it's it's one behavior that is the common thread through like every etiquette campaign that's ever been run in the subway. And I'm sure every public health campaign that's been run since, you know, before the 1918 pandemic, I remember seeing ads about like not spitting because, you know, they, it, that caused the Johnstown flood, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's funny that there, I, I wonder if there was an etiquette about spitting, maybe there is, and we just don't have it. You know, like a little cat spitting like yeah, or something. Yeah. No know. hissing in the subway. Yeah, no hissing in the subway. No. Um, all right. So now we're going to move out of the subway briefly. So by the time we hit like the 70s and 80s, PSA posters are pretty commonplace. And they're covering a variety of social concerns from like everybody's favorite bear telling you how to prevent forest fires to Star Wars characters reminding you to vaccinate your children. But now it's not enough for the PSAs to be visually appealing and look like comic books, essentially. This is instead the moment when the idea of a celebrity or pop culture endorsement um, enters into the PSA space and really takes hold. Um, remember when at the end of G.I. Joe cartoons, you'd see a knowing is half the battle clip <laughs> or when there'd be a very special episode of a popular teenage show, typically discussing issues of like domestic violence, teen pregnancy, drug use. So using familiar beloved characters to get a message across proved to be very, very effective. This is also the era when iconic posters like Act Up Now's Silence Equal, Equals Death image become, became synonymous and symbolic as both a, a protest poster and a means of getting people to recognize the severity of the AIDS crisis. So here you have PSAs becoming cultural phenomenons, becoming so famous that we still will visually reference this when making public health posters today. How many riffs on, on this poster did we see just during the COVID outbreak? Like dozens. I love the design of that poster. Oh, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's so arresting. It's so loaded with subtext. 
And, you know, if it, it, even if you don't know what all of that subtext is, you still get the message. And I, I think, I mean, you, you're the expert on this. I'm sure this won a bunch of awards at some point, probably not when it was issued, because uh, at the time, this was a very incendiary topic to talk about and to promote yeah, I'm in not, this way. I'm not, I don't know if it won any any. I have no idea if it won any awards. I know we did a talk over the summer with um, some of the people that that designed this, the design that came out with this poster, um, uh, in, a, in as part of a lot larger conversation about about protest art. Um, but uh, but no, I have no idea if it won awards. I know when we when before our museum opened, we did a a station domination where you t- where you like take over all the advertising spaces in one subway station, and we did like a greatest hits of po- like the most important posters in poster history. And this obviously was was used again. And the re- this was the poster that caused the biggest reaction in the subway. People were like, "How can like th- it was still cr- getting a visceral response." today, which I think is really, really um, interesting. It only adds to, to the, to how impactful this poster really is. Um, it's, it's a, tr- it's a, tr- as a recovering graphic designer, it's a triumph hmm. of graphic design. Yeah. Um, now, obviously what I've showed you is just a small snapshot of the history of PSA posters in the United States with a few things from Europe, but PSAs exist in all countries. So I'm just gonna kind of quickly touch on a few that either we have in our personal collection at Poster House or which I've come across in my research. So here we have fairly recent posters, which I find really fascinating. They're both from Kenya and they both talk about like wildly different things. The first on the left is informing people that that disabilities here specifically deafness is not the result of a curse being placed on a family and that the family of a child with a disability should not be shunned by society. Meanwhile, the one on the right is about how sexual harassment in the workplace is unacceptable. Both of these are in our digital poster wall when you enter the museum as just things that we have in the collection. Um, now here's an Ethiopian image introducing the health benefits of using a designated toilet space rather than just like going anywhere you want. And in the poly poster next to a similar one put out by Planned Parenthood about reproductive rights. I love like this comparison because that they're both riffing on a more famous British poster featuring a pregnant, pa- pregnant man. Um, But when seen together, you notice that like good imagery and a good concept transcends cultures and time periods. An effective PSA is an effective PSA. And this of course brings us to 2020. Uh, So many groups created PSAs, particularly for the digital space like Instagram, Facebook, all that in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. So the Amplifier Foundation, which is perhaps best known for its affiliation with the street artist Shepard Ferry, issued an open call to artists to submit poster designs that they then promoted with their social media spaces and on their website. So many of these actually reference historic posters from World War I and World War II, like this is a clear nod to what we now know as Rosie the Riveter. The, the same goes in England where the hashtag war on COVID-19 campaign very clearly took classic poster imagery and updated it for the current crisis. So these were printed and posted around London in actual ad spaces. Uh, I believe the government um, or or there was a major uh, corporate sponsor that allowed them to run them in those ad spaces. I love the one on the right, the Britons. Yes. Get on the sofa. (laughs) It looks almost Um, like it would be in a Monty Python interstitial. Oh, uh, totally. Totally. And this is actually the poster that inspired the famous Uncle Sam, I Want You. This came first. Oh, really? I didn't know that. It was originally a British poster. We just made it more famous. Interesting. Yes, we did a whole, a whole. Uh, we used to have this thing called Hot Poster Gossip, which was before we opened as a museum, we would do our entire front facade um, on a specific topic. And so we did in conjunction with the graphic designer, Mirko Illick, a, a uh, history of posters pointing at you. And they all <laughs> were, it, it's, it's like a hundred years of just posters going like that until it giving you a message. And there were so many, and they all started with this poster. Wow. Um, so then also, so, so right now we've had posters that riff on classic imagery, but then there were also posters like these done by Isle of Printing, which is a letterpress studio in Nashville, which created unique posters to inform the public and which I've actually seen in storefronts as far away as like Dallas, Texas this summer. So tons of very different parts of the design world came together this past year for a common cause, either creating entirely new images like these or riffing on the images from our collective graphic design history. Now, Poster House, we took a few different approaches to the PSA. 
We first asked the designer, Rachel Gingrich, to create a set of digital PSAs for us to use when we heard about the shocking and incredibly disturbing treatment of Asian Americans as a result of the misconception that they were responsible for the disease. Then this led to our in-house designer, Mahoshi Fukushima Clark, to design her own PSAs. Now, both of these were available for download on our website. And, and yes, they are technically not posters because they were never printed or street facing, but a graphic can also be a PSA. Um, then, um, obviously, Poster House's big PSA achievement was our partnership with Print Magazine to create a series of digital graphics around New York City, appearing on billboards, care of Times Square Arts, Link NYC, Silvercast, and Pearl Media. So essentially, major advertisers gave up their hoardings for free to us to support uh, messaging about public health and frontline worker support during the early months of the pandemic. And we got some of the biggest names in graphic design to contribute to this project from Adele Rodriguez to Paula Schur. And no design has the same exact message. So some are meant to give hope to the community, some instruction on how to properly social distance, others to thank essential workers for their sacrifices. Um, and these also appeared partially in the subway. So they, they, they bridge the gap between the above and the below ground space. Um, and that pretty much wraps up my very mini history of PSA posters. Uh, and as always, Jody and I are here to work in tandem and answer all your questions. Um, posters are all I do, transit's all she, all she does, so lay it on us. Yeah, I'm looking for more questions and there yeah, haven't really been that many. We've covered most of them. Um, people like what we were talking about. Um, I mean, that's the, the as long as which people is are awesome. happy, that's, that's all I care. I have a question for you. Oh, yes. um, <laughs> Did do you have a favorite PSA? Uh, was it in this presentation, or was it a little too saucy for you to include? Ooh, do you have a favorite PSA? There are lots of. I actually just really say I I have a PSA in my apartment. Um, let me. I'm gonna bring bring you. I'm bringing you over. Look at look at this one. I have to move a plant, but it says, "Sir, don't waste food while you're." Wife saves adopt the doctrine <laughs> of the clean plate. Oh wow! Do your share, and that was That's done great. by the U.S. Food and the U.S. Food Administration. Um, I love that poster. I, I got it from a friend of mine because uh, I believe in I believe in the clean plate doctrine at my house. We must all eat everything. Yes, I, I subscribe to that belief as well. Yes. Well, so you just had me move a plant. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, did Oppie get credit in her time for the great work? Yes, she did. Um, not only because she signed her work, um, there was an internal publication called Transit that did a feature on her. Uh, there were many newspaper articles about her while she was working. Um, she was a very uh, attractive lady. So most of the photos that went with these uh, profiles of her had her you know, sitting with her legs crossed in a very ladylike way. Her hair was perfectly coiffed, you know, and they almost always had her standing next to somebody who was part of the train crew, <laughs> like wearing, you know, wearing like the old school uniform and like looking kind of grungy, which I thought was really hilarious. <laughs> um, so yeah, she did get credit. And uh, when, she, when she died, she got a nice New York Times obit also. Oh, nice. She died the same day Swifty Lazar did. I, I'll never <laughs> when I was doing the, when I was uh, getting the getting uh, the research together uh, for our big collection that we have of her work, uh, I found the obituary and I'm like, oh, Swifty Lazar and oh. Oppie died on the same day. Oh, useful. I see someone uh, asked if, if Proster House is a brick and mortar museum. We are. We're at 119 West 23rd Street, open Thursdays through Sundays. Ooh. And we're all posters all the time. So we all have posters three, all the time. We have three post three. Yes, three poster shows up right now, plus a permanent poster collection. Uh, for those and, of you who are New Yorkers, like diehard New Yorkers, they are located in the old TechServe space. We are. Um, There's a question in the Q&A uh, that says, do you have any suggestions for how to make more effective poster style PSAs for the COVID era? I've seen many at work and in stores that are not great. Well, I mean, that's just, that, that would be the same suggestion across the board for any, any graphic. Um, it also, like scale is very important. 
Um, keeping your text minimal is very important. Giving somebody a graphic to hold on to, like a set, like something that you go to first and then makes you read like the five words. Um, a poster is only effective if it gets your attention and conveys information is in under a second. If it takes longer than that, it's kind of failed. Um, because if you're walking down the street, something has to catch your eye. In the subway, it's a little different because you do, you're, if, I'm on, if I'm like strap hanging and I'm like staring at the wall for five stops, like I, you have a more captive audience. But if it's, if it's a street poster or something in line at the grocery store, like you gotta make it, make it count. Um, so focusing on something that's simple and impactful and like grabs your attention is really um, very important. Less is more. Less is more. Uh, there's, there's a question in the chat that I can answer um, about the process for MTA approving PSA posters for the subway. Um, there is an MTA advertising policy. Uh, it's on their website. It's really easy to find. Um, and there's very specific rules about what you can and can advertise. I would imagine that a public service announcement, especially if it comes from the Department of Health or a, a city government organization or a national government organization, um, you know, I think they just let them do it. You know, um, I don't know. I, I would imagine that they are not compens compensated for publishing them. Um, but I think that what Angelina said before about uh, companies not really complaining, I think. Uh, uh, the advertising company that manages the MTA's ads, which I think is Outfront. It's um, Outfront. We did a whole, we actually did a whole, did you ever, I don't know if we worked through you guys, but we did a whole interview with the guys that paste subway poster, the bill posters in the subway. Yeah, I remember that. The whole that. like day with him. Um, it was wonderful. I like, I, it was one of those like jobs you never see because they're like, they're like poster ninjas. Yeah, they're um, in and out. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. So yes, if you go way back on our blog, there's a, uh, um, the secret life of bill posters. Yeah, um, but uh, Outfront donates that space to them. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, but if anybody wants to wants to know the criteria for advertising with the MTA, it's on their one website under transparency. Ooh. Yes. Um, another question we have in the chat, how important is color for posters? Um, I think oh, both very. of us could answer that, but Angelina, you go first. Yeah, very, very, it's <laughs> essential. Um, uh, high contrast is important. We, there's, there was one poster we had in a previous show on Swiss poster design, and it's a poster that was reissued by the company from the 1920s through the 60s. And the first one, it, it's the same image. It's a woman in a fur coat. Um, it's for a, fur, a furrier. Um, and originally the background was black and the fur was bright white. Um, and they realized that because of like environmental conditions in the in the part of Switzerland that this poster was put up, that that contrast was not like was not great enough. But that if they put it on a medium blue background, that that contrast really popped and people could see it better in the snow. So like you, p there's no like one single color family or or color selection that works for uh, across the board. It really does depend on the environment in which you are putting said poster. Um, so that. And uh, this, I can answer. I can answer this along with uh, a question from the Q and A, which is, "What is your opinion of the MTA wear mask campaign graphics?" Um, although, since I am a, since I work at the Transit Museum, I'm not really supposed to talk about current projects, <laughs> but I think it's okay for me to talk about that. Um, so you were talking about color. And those ads are pretty much two color ads. Well, really one color because black doesn't always count as a color. It's yellow with black text. Yes. It's very simple, uh, much like Oppie's economy of line. The figures in them are very economical and they are not, you know, they're identifiable as male and female, but not really anything else. They're just generic people. Um, and they show you how to wear a mask uh, properly. And they are also in pretty much every language that the MTA oh, yeah. speaks. Um, and the MTA does speak more than 25 languages. I think the last count that I got was somewhere in the 40s. Um, wow. And you can see that in the uh, service notices, mostly when you're on the subway, that uh, certain subway lines will have uh, the mask ads they are in Asian languages, like the ones out, um, I live in Queens, so I see a lot of the mask ads in uh, whatever Indic language that they're in. I think it's Punjabi, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm not as schooled in that. I see them in Korean. I see them in simplified Chinese. 
I see them in uh, regular Chinese, uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, I, I try to read them and like remember my way back when I used to be able to read uh, pictograms. Um, and sometimes there's some Creole and all that, um, but you may not find those languages in other parts of the city. Uh, out by Brighton Beach, there's a lot of Cyrillic. So, um, and I think that's kind of cool because they're dynamic ads that are served up on digital screens so they can change them on the fly. So if there's a language that um, they notice that people are speaking that they're not reaching, they can change it rather quickly. It's like a modular design, which is kind of cool. That was a little bit more than what you asked about, but um, <laughs> that is my opinion of the MTA wear a mask campaign is that it's reaching a lot of people and it's very visually striking. I mean, PSAs, they're just meant to be effective. So as yeah. long as they're reaching people, that's really all that matters. Um, I also see someone, Susan mentions that uh, Tatiana, uh, uh, we've worked with, Ta I'm gonna butcher her last name. I think it's Fazalizade, but again, I, I, I really hope I pronounced that correctly. We've worked with her a bunch. When we did our Women's March show, she did an artist tour of the show. We did a book signing for her book at the in, in the um, gift shop at the museum. She's a tremendous artist and she has done a bunch of PSAs, mostly about street harassment. Um, so love, love seeing her work around, around uh, the city for sure. All Someone right. in the chat mentioned that uh, the latest mask campaign is multicolored, um, which I have not seen. So um, I, I am going to emerge from my cocoon sometime tomorrow and uh, ride public transportation. So I will be on the lookout for that. I mean, I'm always out and about because I'm, I'm a reckless individual, but I, I have not seen the multicolored ones yet. So I'm intrigued. The person mentioned that they are, they are especially, they especially pop on the e-screens on the Metro North trains and stations. Ah, Metro North. And I that's where I'm going North to be tomorrow. Be. So I will see. Ooh, um, ooh. Can't yes, wait to hear I know. back. But yeah, I mean, I have been taking the subway quite often, but um, honestly, uh, my time spent on the subway, like many other people, is maybe just sitting there with this shocked look on my face, like, I can't believe I am actually going somewhere and getting a little bit of an anxiety attack because the person, you know, three people away from me is not wearing their mask properly. Uh, even though the sign, uh, the ad behind them is telling them how, <laughs> so, which, is, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, there's another question in the Q&A. Is there a way for the MTA to assess the efficacy of the PSAs it posts? Um, I would venture a guess and say yes, um, but I would not know what that was and what their metrics of success are. But that's a really good question for the MTA question. press office. <laughs> uh, and you can be sure that I will be asking that question myself. Yeah, indeed. I have no okay. idea how you measure efficacy since but if it's like something basic like mask wearing, most people already know that. So they the, like the efficacy of the of the PSA is like presumably it's only reaching people who are dumb enough not to do that. Right. So I, I don't know. I I don't know. Um, uh -huh. um, awesome. Well, guys, are there any last questions before we say goodbye for the evening? I don't really see any, so that's good. Right. That means well, that thank we you so much. told them what they mm -hmm. wanted to know. Um, please turn into Jody and my my talk at the museum. Salvador is going to put a link in the chat um, because on Oppie, which is going to be amazing. Um, and please stop by the either of our museums. Well, when when your museum reopens, obviously. Yes. Although I will say I am the biggest um, like proselytizer for the Transit Museum. It is my <laughs> favorite museum in New York. I say this every time. They have the best public programming for like like the most bang for your buck for any membership is the Transit Museum. So Thank I will you. say that. Later. And I I am in love with Poster House. I get to nerd out about all kinds of things whenever I go there, and I can't wait to see Angelina in person real soon because they have an excellent exhibit up about one of my favorite people, Hunter S. Thompson. Oh yes, and his run for sheriff. <laughs> yes, of Aspen. It is wild, wild. And those posters are fantastic looking. So I can't wait to see them in person. Yes, please do. All right, everyone. Oh. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And not much for me to add, but you know, um, join us for um, Jody's Oppy Talk on May fifth. But before that, we have another Transit After Hours Talk on April fifteenth with Subway Social Club, and we invite you to talk your transit memories. So um, you have more information about that on nytransitmuseum.org. Until next time, we'll see you guys later. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.